Hey everyone, and welcome to the Ballet and Beyond podcast, where we interview current and former professionals, teachers, patrons, and more from the world of ballet and dance. You'll get insight from top dancers and instructors in the industry, as well as local performers and educators, as they talk about their experiences in the business. I'm your host today, Pete Commander. If you're from the greater Baltimore area, don't forget to check out Charm City Ballet, located in Cockeysville, where we offer classes for all dancers ages 3 through adult. Visit www.charmcityballet.com for more information on classes, auditions, and upcoming performances. This is episode 5 of Ballet and Beyond, and we're excited for today's guest, former Dayton Ballet principal, Annalise Bottomer. Annalise began dancing at 6 years old and later graduated from Goucher College with honors in dance performance and a minor in mathematics. After first performing as a principal with Boulder Ballet in Colorado, she joined Dayton Ballet as a principal where she performed for 8 seasons. She is currently the artistic director at Contemporary Ballet Academy. All right, Annalise, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Let's start by talking about your decision to go to Goucher to specifically to join a college dance program rather than auditioning right out of high school um, and the sort of the factors that went into that decision. Sure. Um, I think that every dancer out there sort of has their own path whether it's going to take them to a professional career or just continue their training. For me, I was always really invested in academics growing up. And my biggest fear, honestly, was that if I jumped right into the professional world, that I would get burnt out early on. So my biggest decision from high school was actually deciding if I wanted to go to a conservatory type setting or a more um, liberal education college Mm. area. Um, So I actually ended up doing a lot of research, looking up different schools, finding various dance programs that interested me. And for someone who really wanted to focus on ballet, that narrowed down furthermore what schools would provide what I was looking for in my training. Um, And then the third factor was finding a school that would allow me to do both academics in a very rigorous way and also dance training in a rigorous way. Mm. Um, I happened upon Goucher in some book that was, I think it was called 10 Colleges That Change Lives or something like this. Um, and it really boasted that the program allowed for people to pursue multiple paths at the same time, saying that especially a lot of the dance majors still did other, um, focuses as well, which really piqued my interest. Um, my final decision for schools actually came between Boston Conservatory and Goucher and, um, I visited both, auditioned at both, and I love Boston as the city, so that was a big draw for me. (laughs) Okay. And um, also, they have amazing faculty there. They have a great program that, you know, you really do full day training, so it's like dance summer camp all day for your college experience. Um, But then when I visited Goucher, I also kind of fell in love with the feeling of it. And anyone who I talk to who's interested in going to do some sort of dance at college or even just thinking about taking the university route from high school, I always give them the advice to actually visit the school because you get such a different sense of a place when you're actually there and you're able to picture yourself there or, you know, like meeting the faculty are those people that you want to learn from because that's who's going to be guiding you through your years there. So when I actually visited, uh, even other students that were there auditioning, it just felt like the right connection for me. Mm -hmm. Um, The size of the school for the type of focus I wanted to have. um, And then also the other side of it, that they still had the academics required and I would be able to do all all of my interests. So, I ended up going with Goucher. Um, I was really only able to do that because I got a few scholarships that 
allowed me to do that financially. All right. um, but that's how I ended up at Goucher. Okay. Um, and you have a minor in math, right? Correct. Correct. I have my minor in math. Um, I was going to try to double major in both, which is really neat that in one school you would be allowed to do dance and math because usually a school wouldn't have strong programs in both of those areas um, or or even allow for a student to have a schedule that would enable them to do that. Okay. Um, but I ended up pushing myself really hard. I only graduated in three years because I wanted to get out in the dance world and really be a professional ballet dancer. Mm. While I was at Goucher, we had a um, guest artist come in who was the director of Dayton Ballet. His name is Dermot Burke. And uh, he worked with us. He was great. I liked his teaching style. He liked my ambition and uh, brains as a dancer. Mm. <laughs> and so after he left, he actually called my um, advisor, my dance advisor, saying that there someone got injured in their company. And he was wondering if I would come and fill in as a company dancer there. So that was really one of the hardest decisions I had to make, but I think that question had to be asked of me so that I could push myself for the next part of my life. Mm. So I decided to say, no, I'm so sorry, I can't take this opportunity because I really felt if I went at that point in the semester, you know, of my college years that I I didn't know if I would actually come back and finish my degree. And that was a really big goal of mine and important for me just to have in my back pocket as going forth as a professional dancer. Hmm. So I told him no, which felt really scary. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and decided that I would really push to finish my degree in three years. And I did that. And then the next year actually was a huge economic bomb. That, I guess that was uh, 2008, eight, nine. Eight what to year? nine, eight, yeah. Yes, eight to nine. Yeah. And the company that Dermot was the director of actually cut their dancers from 20 to 12 that season. Okay. So that was... Um, sort of a sign to me saying that I made the right choice because as a new person coming in, of course, you would be the first to go usually. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm glad that I decided to stay, finish out my schooling. And then I, I auditioned the following year after I graduated, but that was the year that the company was cut. So he didn't have any contracts open for me. Mm -hmm. Um. So I ended up dancing with Boulder Ballet for a year back in my hometown, which was nice to be, um, you know, near family again after being a, across the country for those three years at Goucher. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted more than what I had grown up with. Mm. So I went out and re-auditioned. And the following year, Dayton Ballet did have a contract open for a female company dancer. So. He Dermot offered me the job. He sort of had kept me on his short list over the few years that we had known each other. But I always think for myself in finding a job professionally that it is so important who you know. And it's, you know, there's very, very few percentage of people who are going to go to a cattle call audition and get a job from that. If you've never worked with the director, if they don't know your face, if they don't know how you work as a dancer, I think a lot of, a lot of young aspiring dancers don't necessarily realize it's not what tricks you can do. It's actually how you work and assess their comments and pick up choreography. You know, it's how quick you are in the studio, how professional you can act. If you can step into a role you know, that you're understudying and be prepared. There's just so many other elements besides just 
what your arabesque looks like or if you can do your triple pirouettes on point or whatnot. It's interesting so, that you say that too. I've I've heard a couple people comment that they almost feel like they're cheating if they happen to have an in or if they know somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, but from what you're saying, it's actually it's actually more important to get yourself out there and actually just talk to people, get to know people, have your face in front of people. Yeah, I think definitely the networking of, you know, them being able to recognize you um, as a person instead of just one of the masses is really important. And then the more that they have an experience to work with you, like one on one as a dancer, it gives them more insight into what you could bring to their company. So for like Dermot worked with me for two weeks at Goucher. And he was really able to see, you know, what I brought to the table in a real working environment over six hours of the day. And that's what really like attracted him to me as a, as an employee. Okay. Okay. So I think especially, especially these days with YouTube and, you know, everything boasting the tricks of dance. There's so much more that directors are looking for than just a trickster. Mm. And having time to show what you can bring to the table beyond high extensions and great jumps, you know, is is what makes a company mesh well for a, a real working environment. Mm. Mm. So back to actually you had mentioned doing two separate auditions for Dayton. Yes. Um, what are, talk about some strategies that you use to prepare for auditioning. Okay, great question. Um, so auditioning is a very scary and vulnerable thing to do. Not only are you going to a place that you don't know, um, dancing in front of, you know, other people that are either, if you're at like a big open audition, everyone, you know, for 50 people in the room there might be one job it's very cutthroat or if you are going to an invited company audition you know everyone in the company is watching you Mm, right (laughs) so no matter what your audition situation is it's going to be a little bit nerve-wracking and i think that you know all directors know that's the case going in and that's the good news is that most of them were dancers once and and they remember that. Um, and a little bit of nerves is good. You know, when you have a performance coming up, it's very natural and normal to have those butterflies in your stomach and a little bit of adrenaline pumping sometimes, you know, ekes out that last fear or whatnot. I think the harder things to do are to not clam up. You know, I think a, when you get into a stressful or tense place, a lot of people sort of like turn into robots and just dance in an enclosed box instead of trying to let your energy stay free. Not only is that going to help your muscles do what they know how to do, but it's also going to put you a step above the students that are just students. Because you you don't want to look like a student in an audition. You want to look like a dancer that is reaching a professional level. Mm. So the the freer that you can sort of stay while maintaining your the clarity of your movement, I think is what would really catch directors' eyes. Mm. So what are the do you have to do any uh, like audition oversight in the position that you're in at Contemporary? Yes, I do. Um, I hold all the auditions. <laughs> okay. So now, now I'm on the other side of that table, um, judging. You know, and it's not in a professional setting. It's it's just in a school, but mm-hmm. all the same principles apply. You know, even if you work with the kids every day, which most of them I see at least four times a week, then suddenly you put the word audition in, and they all just clam up. Mm. So. Mm. Um, it's very, you know, I, I have this, I tell them at the beginning of every audition, you know, this, this is what we do every day. It's just the class, you know, us, we know you, (laughs) but yes, it is, 
it is interesting to be on the other side of the table now. So you're auditioning uh, students for the school or for performance? Both. We have uh, what we call a fast track program at Contemporary Dance Academy. That is for the students who want to really pursue dance at the pre-professional level. Um, And so we have an audition for that if you want to be part of that program. And then we also audition for all of our um, main stage productions. So we have a Nutcracker audition. We last year we did Wizard of Oz, just like you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we had auditions for that. So there still is definitely, um, you know, professional expectation about how we want to run the school so that it gives the kids a real sense of what's going on in the real world there. Okay. So in auditions, what do you look for in a potential student versus a dancer for performance? And where's the overlap between the two? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so I, this is just a a little bit about me as a dancer, as a dancer, which feeds into what I look for in others. For me, I trained in classical ballet, um, but the world now, unless you are a prodigy, only classical ballet going to be in Bolshoi, 16 year old almost every single company out there requires you to have contemporary movement quality okay um so in in dancers of today i feel it's very important to have an extremely extremely solid ballet foundation Mm -hmm. but to also have the ability to move and pick up choreography that is more contemporary ballet or contemporary modern styling. Mm. Just because that's what's asked of the dancer of today, you know, times they are changing. And I love contemporary movement myself. I love doing that style of dance as well. Um, You have to be adaptable as a dancer today to make it. And um, I think that's really important also So things that I'm looking for in students are clean, clear technique in the in the ballet foundation, ability to be able to release that and not feel uncomfortable with new movement. Um, Also, there's this. hmm, How should I say this? Everyone has seen a performance when there is some dancer, student or professional on stage that for whatever reason catches your eye. And it's that X factor or whatever we want to call it. And I think one of the hardest things is to be able to let your inner X factor shine in an, in an audition or in the studio and not just put it on stage. Mm. Because as someone that's auditioning or like as the, the director, here I sit, how do I know if you can just bring that out on stage if I don't see it here? Right. And I think it's a very like vulnerable place to be as a dancer because it's really letting you know, shedding another layer of yourself to let others in, in the studio setting feels a little bit more uncomfortable because people are closer to you. There's not, you know, the, the lights and the costumes that make it easier for you to become that real character. But I really love to see the performance start in the studio because the more we can bring it out sooner, think of how far then, it can land when it comes time for the performance. Right. So that's a really big one for me to sort of like see, see that X factor before the show. The irony, one of the ironies of you saying this is, and you know this, we've had this conversation, but that you're, you've always been since school, you've always been one of my favorite dancers to watch. 
And I think that a big part of that is that, that, that you have the ability to sort of let that out even just in class and don't necessarily just reserve it for stage. What, as a performer, what kind of things do you think about or keep in your mind to allow that to be the case? Mm. Um, let me circle right back to that question. Okay. The other, the other element to that is, so I spent, you know, um, about 10 years dancing professionally before I decided to step away. And in that amount of time, you know, a daily, daily studio life is you're, you're in the studio six days a week, anywhere between six and eight hours a day. And the parts of dance that, that fulfill most people and keep us driving are, are the times you get to perform and find a new part of yourself, whether it's as an artist or if it, the dance brings a new part of yourself as a human. Hmm. So for me, I think that I always did that in the studio or at least tried to when I was able to, because 95% of the time that you're working isn't on stage. So if you want to spend all of this time not having those little elements to really like grow and find a new sense of self, then you're only allowed, you know, the one weekend you're on stage once every six weeks to be your guiding light sort of thing. Mm, okay. So I think that definitely like helped me as a dancer to push myself to do that mm. anyway. Um, so I'm going to keep us on you, your experience as a dancer for now. Um, you had told us a story about a choreographer you had worked with that during a rehearsal one time, she kept making you repeat over and over and over and telling you that she wasn't getting what she was looking for. Tell that story and sort of talk about your experience of that. Sure. Um, so this particular choreographer uh, is Gina Patterson, and she is one of my all-time favorite choreographers I have ever worked with. Also, one of the most challenging choreographers I have ever worked with. And I think those things kind of go hand in hand, because when you are pushed to such a limit, that you go beyond what you believe your capabilities are, then you come out the other side thinking that was amazing. Um, and just realizing how much you grow from, from those hard times. Um, this piece was a duet I was working on. And the beginning of the piece is just a woman walking across the stage, holding a book in silence. And the whole premise of this duet was about depicting not a dancer, but a human. Mm. And one of the hardest things as a trained dancer is to let all of that go and just trust that being a woman and being you as a woman or you as a man is enough for the stage because all the other time are mostly as we're learning rep, we are told to be that trained dancer or present yourself as here I am on Elise, the ballerina here I am the dancer on Elise. But this choreographer said, Nope, you this, you're going to walk across the stage and say, here I am a woman. And to really release all of those layers in just walking across the stage, we spent at least 45 minutes of me just walking. Sometimes I would get halfway and she'd say, no, go back. Sometimes I would get all the way to this bench that was a prop on stage right. I would almost sit down, no, go back. Mm. And it was just like inner work happening at the same time, which is also why that piece turned into something so fulfilling to me because it was beyond just the movement of dancing. It really came to a full place of emotional, um, soul broadening. You know, it was all the elements that a human has 
combined with the dancing that made it so special. Mm. And, and that's where, you know, being able to sort of be vulnerable with new movements and being willing to put hard work in, try it over and over again. You know, you have to be willing to sort of let yourself be in this pick apart place, you know, and, and we're used to being criticized every day for our dancing. That's part of how you get better. But, you know, this woman, she really picks you apart beyond the outer physical. So it was it was very intense. I, I felt myself getting frustrated on the inside. And then I thought, I just can't even I can't even walk. Right. You know, how am I going to do this? <laughs> nine minute duet. Right. So, um, it, yeah, it was definitely an experience I will never forget. But in the end, and once we got to the stage, I was able to just strip everything away like she wanted and and just be me on stage. So it was a beautiful outcome to a very difficult rehearsal process. Mm. Is that something you feel like that a, that most directors like should be able to? to like take a dancer to a point that they break them through that wall? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it takes a very particular person to be able to join all of those elements of dance into one. I've worked with several, several choreographers and um, I think probably maybe two maybe two have been able to do that. So it's not a skill that everyone has. And even choreographically speaking, you know, like how many pieces have I done that I've danced? Sure. But have they fulfilled me in any other way? No. So, you know, there's, I think in anyone's career, there's, you know, the handful of piece of pieces you can count on that really brought something to you more as as a human as an artist rather than just being physical movement Mm. um but i do not i do not think that all directors have that capability Mm. so let's switch and talk about you um and your directing right now tell us a little bit about uh, the role you played this past year and how that's going to change in the coming season Okay, sure. Um, so last May, I retired from Dayton Ballet, um, literally having no idea what my future held. And I think for a lot of professional dancers, it's a really scary time and a really scary decision to make, saying, I'm stepping away from this life that I've worked for since I was six years old. Um, I actually saw this job as a ballet director at a school in Fort Collins come up on a job search that I did. And within two weeks, it was a very quick process. Within two weeks, I had the interviews. I did a teaching audition and I was offered the job. Wow. So it was quite a whirlwind of unknowns to a lot of big changes moving from Ohio to Colorado starting a new job you know teaching a lot I always knew I like teaching but what I really love only teaching sort of thing so I took this job as ballet director and sort of fell in love with the kids right away it's a it's a great studio um I had some really nice talent to work with in within the student body and what was nice is that the the owner of the studio she really gave me a lot of freedoms for for what I wanted to teach and the style that I felt would benefit these kids the most okay so within this ballet directorship I basically did a full new nutcracker just because I, you know, wanted to make some changes and upgrades to what they've been doing in the past. And then I pretty much choreographed all of 
Wizard of Oz also for our spring show. So for me, it was, yes, I was the ballet director this past year, but I was doing way more than that just because of the product I wanted to put on stage, not only for the students abilities, but also for the community, Mm. you know, and, and I really enjoyed those parts of it. You know, like sometimes Saturday rehearsals are my favorite day because I can go in and, and be a little bit more artistic in choreography and, you know, have the rehearsal process, which I always really enjoy sometimes more than class. Yeah. So that sort of springboarded this, promotion to artistic director of the studio in that the extra work that I did last year sort of showed these the studio owner what I was capable of in that arena and you know even even more so you know I have all these other ideas for this year so uh, we had a discussion about it and and she was happy to to promote me up to artistic director which is great I, I'm also still ballet director since I teach all of the highest level of that. But yeah, I am excited to, you know, go further into the artistic side of production. And, you know, I, I spent all day yesterday building nutcracker sets. So, mm. <laughs> you know, all you students out there, if you think your teachers are off during the summer, we're not. <laughs> we're, we're already doing things. Yes. So, yes. yeah. Do you have any, do you miss the stage? I guess that's really mm-hmm. what I'm at. Do you miss the stage? Do you, like, I know it's only been, it's only been a year, but, but do you, like, do you feel like even now that that's something that's missing that you would maybe eventually like to find an outlet for? Mm-hmm. Great question. Um, so I actually, there's, there's two smaller dance companies uh, near Fort Collins. They're both in Boulder. One of them is Boulder Ballet, and then the other one is a contemporary modern company called Third Law Dance Theater. Okay. And um, I, I knew them both from growing up, and like I mentioned before, I did dance with Boulder Ballet for one year before going to Ohio. Right. And they actually asked me to guest with them this year. So I was able to do two different performances. Um, One was a contemporary ballet and then one was just a modern performance. So I've been really fortunate in that I've still been able to to sort of dance and have some performing opportunities instead of just being cut off cold turkey. Right. I think for me, the hardest thing, honestly, is that, you know, for these smaller companies, they only rehearse three or four times a week for a half a day, um, which is great for them and enables, you know, people to have other jobs and it allowed me to do it while I was teaching. And right. Everything. right. Um, but after experiencing myself as a dancer at my peak, being in the studio six days a week, six hours a day, the hard thing for me is then dancing when I don't feel like I'm at my best because I'm not training the most. Right. And the and and it's okay. Like my body I don't think could train that way anymore. You <laughs> know? So so it's it's more a question of like am I happy putting this product of my dancing on stage when I don't necessarily feel like it's my best technique or I'm in the best shape or things of that nature um I'm a I think that the contemporary and modern route is a lot more forgiving in that way just in the um social aspects and the rest of the company you know there it's just a different world than the straight ballet studio um and I definitely think that I would love to still perform now after this baby comes. <laughs> right, right. And that's that's part of it too. Right. Um, but I think it would be really hard for me to strap on point shoes and pink tights again, mm. just because of the level of the product I would be able to put out and knowing what 
I used to be able to do. Hmm. All right. Let's move into sort of what's next. Um, now, as artistic director, what have, what are your some of your goals for the school? Mm. Um, so, ooh, that's, a, that's a good question. I would love to grow our fast track program okay. um, to get a little bit bigger. Also, um, having a, an older group of girls that all the young ones can really look up to. I would love to just, you know, really have a great role model group up there at the top. I, I remember growing up through the studio, you know, being totally obsessed with the high level girls. They were the world and everything to you. And I think that a lot of teenagers don't necessarily realize how much of an impact they have on the rest of the studio. And I have a I, I have a great group of girls right now. I'm not saying that I don't, but I think that is so important to have a strong group of leaders at the top mm. to show, you know, correct respect, etiquette, how to handle yourself in rehearsals, all the things, you know, you, you learn, you learn so much from the top. Right. Um, I would love to create a summer performance series. Parents are always wanting to to see their kids dance more. Um, so I'd love to have a end of summer session performance, maybe at an outdoor gazebo or some something outside. I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. I would also love to sort of increase our performance numbers, just in the amount of performances we're able to. To get and I know a lot of that is like the theater rentals and, and whatnot but you know these kids work half a year on Nutcracker and then get their three shows in and, right. and that's it but right. Um, so that's sort of a, a dream wish I guess if, if we had the money for it right and beyond that I think it's really just training the kids from you know, the nine, 10, or even younger than that, the seven, eight year olds to really create a solid foundation so that by the time they get to me, like I have a, I have a great foundation to really ricochet forward into the future. Um, and that takes time to sort of set up, you know, the training for each level, what I would expect for each level to, to be accomplishing and, you know, finding the right instructors for those younger levels so that it really is the base of what comes to the high fast track. <laughs> well, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because we've talked to plenty of parents who will say something like, uh, you know, well, it doesn't matter that her teacher isn't very good because she's only three or six or ten and she might not even dance when she's older. Um, but mm -hmm. what you're saying is that it absolutely matters definitely definitely yep because it i mean the the sooner you can create the good patterns the the easier it will be to stack on all of the next levels of technique opposed to having to strip down with all the bad habits once someone comes to you and then we build you know it, it's just like building a house if you have a good foundation then you can add all the frills onto it but if if you try to put the frills on top of something crumbling it's just a disaster thanks so much to Annalise for being with us on Ballet and Beyond for more information about Contemporary Dance Academy located in Fort Collins, Colorado visit ContemporaryDanceAcademy.com if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram and give Ballet and Beyond a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For questions and guest requests, please email us at balletandbeyondpodcast at gmail.com. I'm your host, Pete Commander. Thanks for listening.